Well, hello again. It's Bruce Williams, and today I want to present part eight in my series on the selected gross pathology of the respiratory system. And this is probably going to be the shortest lecture in this lecture series. We're going to talk about protozoal diseases. While there are a number of protozoans that end up in the lungs and may cause disease, a lot of them don't leave significant or definitive gross lesions. For example, think about all the protozoans that live within the blood of birds, and a lot of them have schizonts, schizogony, gametogeny within the lungs of birds, but the lesions aren't specific and often not discernible. So let's look at a couple that I think you have a pretty good shot at identifying based on a little history and maybe some gross lesions. Before I do that, I want to thank my friends and colleagues who have given me these fantastic pictures over the years. Our first picture is lungs from a cat. And if you look at this and you say, you know, that looks like some of those dimorphic fungi that you showed in the last lecture, I pretty much cannot uh, count that against you. But this is a lung in an animal that died of disseminated toxoplasmosis. Toxoplasma is a pretty common uh, protozoan parasite of a wide range of species. Because the definitive host is the cat, it has its sexual cycle uh, within the cat, where you have the production of gametes and oocysts within the intestine, we tend to ignore the cat as a potential dead-end host for this parasite. But if the animal is immunosuppressed for any reason, or just sometimes spontaneously, something goes haywire and they end up with toxoplasma cysts within multiple organs, and they suffer the same fate as any other animal. Now, toxoplasma has always sort of been a puzzlement to me because of the tremendous necrotizing response associated with toxoplasma infection. Uh, we know that toxoplasma, uh, the schizonts will enter cells and they will form cysts and eventually that cell will explode. But if you look histologically at these tissues, the number of cysts, when compared to the amount of necrosis you see, is all out of whack. Some of these toxoplasma lesions are as necrotizing as bacteria with significant exodoxin production. So whenever I see in the lungs a large amount of necrosis, uh, in a mammalian species, I want to think just for a minute of the possibility of toxoplasmosis. You see necrosis in the intestine if it's in there, you would see it in the brain, or whatever, and the lung is no different. If the animal survives for any length of time, the reparative phase may cause lesions as well. And I think that this animal might have lived for a while. There are, is a lot of uh, cellular proliferation in addition to the necrosis here. And you get the typical reparative phase that you see within the lung with type two pneumocyte proliferation and then fibrosis and smooth muscle hyperplasia. One of the species that uh, toxoplasma is especially a problem for are marsupials, especially wallabies and kangaroo. This is toxoplasmosis in the lung of a wallaby. And you can see these areas of hemorrhage and necrosis scattered through. They really are a problem. And this is a great picture by my friend Raquel Wretch. If you live in the South, you may come across another protozoan parasite that causes severe problems in cats. As we look at this poor cat, you can see a number of problems. Uh, because we're talking about lungs, the lungs are still inflated. They're sort of meaty. They have areas of hemorrhage and necrosis scattered through. But if we look at the rest of the animal, one thing that should jump out at you is that the animal is severely icteric. There appears to be fluid accumulation within the plural space. The spleen is absolutely huge here and the liver is somewhat discolored and pale and probably if we took a blood sample from this animal it might be fairly anemic. This is a condition that is known as cytozoonosis in, uh, in cats. It's an interesting parasite. Cytozoon felis 
affects uh, domestic and wild felids. Its natural host is the bobcat, and it's a tick-borne disease. So the tick will feed on an infected animal and then take another blood meal and inject the, uh, uh, the parasite into a naive animal. Cytozoan felis actually has, it's a red blood cell parasite. But before that, it goes through a phase in mononuclear phagocytes, especially macrophages. And the schizonts in these macrophages are absolutely huge. And it only takes three or four of them to clog a small vessel, like a pulmonary capillary. So what we're seeing here is actually areas of infarction followed by, or thrombosis, followed by infarction. It gives us this very characteristic uh, checkerboard pattern of hemorrhages within the lung that in every case I've seen always looks like this. When the schizonts are liberated from the macrophages or when the macrophage explodes, you also have a pulse of vasoactive amines, which further cause damage to endothelial cells and sort of make this vascular damage in multiple organs worse. You, it's not just in the lungs, but it shows up best there. You will see these gamons, these absolutely huge gamons within macrophages in every organ of the body. There was a recent paper on lesions in the brain by Dan Risi from the University of Georgia, who sees a lot of cases of this. So these animals, uh, they have a fluid uh, in multiple spaces. They're anemic, they're icteric, they have a high fever, they have dark urine, and uh, a very unfortunate situation for these particular animals. Cytozoan felis. Okay, I got one more picture in the series and then we're done. But this is a great picture from my friend Rob Porter. And you have to look closely at this turkey pole. But if you start to look closely, you'll see that there is mucus uh, coating the oropharynx. You can see a mucoid conjunctivitis. And if you look really, really close, you might see these little round things covering the uh, inside of the animal's oral tract and, and they will extend, if you believe me, down into the uh, nasal cavity, into the air sacs as well. And it'll probably have some in his GI tract all the way down to the bursa. And this is Cryptosporidium bailei. And this is Cryptosporidium bailei affects chickens, turkeys, and ducks. There's another one, Cryptosporidium meleagridis, that uh, affects turkey and quail, but only go after the GI tract. Uh, the avian cryptosporidia don't affect mammals, um, but they do have a combined respiratory and GI site of infection. These animals demonstrate significant respiratory signs with uh, coughing and sneezing, and in severe cases, dyspnea. The animal is able to mount a strong cell-mediated immunity uh, it may shake off the infection, uh, but you can have high morbidity and mortality in affected animals, especially with those with sort of weak or not great immune systems. In the respiratory tract, they really like ciliated epithelium, um, so you will see them within the trachea, the uh, bronchi, and in the air sacs as well. So Cryptosporidium bailei, a particular respiratory pathogen in various species of poultry. Oh, and that brings us to the end of this. Our next lecture is going to be considerably longer. We're going to get into the helminth diseases, all of the lungworms. Well, not all of the lungworms, because a little bit of lungworms uh, goes a long way. But we want to look at some of the uh, species that we see in various uh, animals of importance in veterinary medicine. So I hope you'll come back and join me for that one. Uh, for now, stay safe, stay healthy, and I'll see you again.